also be spoilers to Psycho, which is 57 years old. <laughs> so sorry again about that. Uh, and, and first and foremost, guys, congratulations on five amazing what? things. Such a great show. And I guess let's, let's start from the beginning, starting with Freddie. Um, I, you know, I'm curious, now that the show has played itself out, what was the pitch when you first, like, when all of you were running for the show, what did they tell you the show was going to be? And, and did they fulfill that promise at the end of the five years? Now, in retrospect. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope so. I, I uh, it was five years ago. It's quite a, it's been quite a long time. It's hard, um, I mean, I think, I think what was great is that at the end of season three, um, they, we knew that we were going to have these last two years with which to wrap up the story. And so it felt, it feels satisfying now that we got to end it on our own terms, the way that we wanted to do, and the way that the writers, as you were saying, envisioned from the very beginning, as opposed to being part of a show that just is suddenly, you know, one season just gets the rug right pulled from underneath it. But I think it's, it was always going to be this prequel to Psycho. I mean, that's what it was pitched to me as from the very beginning. And the, uh, you know, the love story in a way between Norman and, and his mother. And obviously there's, you know, this guy tries to <laughs> get him in <laughs> Wait, did this bleed off the screen? This, um, <laughs> oh. I'm glad it worked. As pitched, you know, finally he was able to, to die and, um, <laughs> Freddie was in the writer's room the last season, and, yeah. and what was pitched for me was slightly different than what was shot. <laughs> so somehow things changed through the course of season five, spoiler alert. Um, at one point, I think I was supposed to kill you, and, and suddenly that, that started to change. But is anybody disappointed with that ending? Yeah. Wow. The complaining it was like Norman has a brother. Why is he listening to an iPad or whatever? Yeah, you know, iPod. <laughs> Nobody cares about that shit now. But anyway, <laughs> so when you get brought in and they tell you at the very beginning you were going to be Norman's brother, uh, and also because that character didn't exist, did you think, oh shit, I don't know if I'm going to make it for the whole <laughs> run? So what was what was Dylan described to you as? Uh, well, so I, I will tell you this. Um, I didn't know, obviously. The outcome of the show was not described to me from the beginning because even though they say that they knew what would happen, I, it's not exactly true. <laughs> uh, they came up with some of that stuff as they went. Um, you know, I, I guess like kind of the, the show in general was sort of pitched to me and and the type of character that you play. And obviously, like for me, that was like kind of a weird sort of position because I didn't know if everybody would react negatively to Norman having a brother because he didn't. Psycho, um, but I didn't really care. I was like, whatever, this would be cool. We'll mix it up. Uh, and then, to be honest, like, you know, at about season at the end of season three, maybe sometime during season four, I don't remember. I got a, a call and a voicemail from one of the, the co-creators, and and uh, she sort of she was like gushing about how great the season was and, and how much she loved it and and stuff like that. And um, she sort of spilled the beans and she. She was up on the voicemail, she was like, you know, and to think when we, when we first started writing the show, like we brought in this Dylan character and we were going to kill him in the first season. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's funny, like, nobody mentioned that to me. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> so from here on out, I always ask, how soon am I going to die? <laughs> I want to know now, yes or no. Um, so yeah, thankfully, I guess, you know, obviously they didn't, but... Um, I don't know, man. I was just, you know, I, the, the scripts were so amazing, um, and just an amazing crew, cast, and you know, I think it's kind of like all there. And so, as from an actor's standpoint, it kind of had a sense of a no-brainer. Yeah. Can you guys hear them okay? Yeah. You sure? I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass this for you guys to talk because this is the best mic. Yeah. And 
they want to hear from you. So just pass it down. Sure. So, uh, so what about you, Nasser? Because you had you had a little bit of history with Carlton, correct? On Lost. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I worked with uh, Carlton and Lost since he called me. Um, I, I bumped into him at an event, and then shortly after that, he's you know he called her, he called my manager and wondered if I would come on the show as a guest, as a guest star. And uh, I said, well, I sure, I'd love to work with him again. And you know, I knew it was Bates Motel, but I hadn't read anything. So he sent me uh, the first six episodes. And I figured I'd get to him by the weekend. And I started reading it. And I was, I was up until like 3 or 4 in the morning. I, I read all of them. And I couldn't wait to call him the next day. And I was like, yeah, man, of course. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so it, that's the way it worked out for me. It doesn't always work out that way. But, but I, the, there wasn't a lot in the first season for my character in terms of development. So what he, what he pitched to me was like, look, eventually, if, if there's chemistry with you and Norma, we'll, we'll pair you guys up. So thankfully that worked out. That did work out. Now Ryan, so uh, Chick is quite a character. Um, 
didn't know Psycho. And, and just a very brief story, I went to a bank, I think during season one or two, and I was wearing the shower scene shirt, you know? Uh, and the, the lovely teller was like, what's that? I'm like, it's Norman Bates from Psycho. She's like, oh, like Bates Motel? And I'm like, yeah. She's like, but that's Mother. And I'm like, no, Norman Bates kills his mother and takes her place. And she's like, what? <laughs> Stuff. But uh, did you guys get a sense of that, that you were meeting fans that had no idea that this was based on something else? I'm not on Twitter. I need to get on to get on Twitter. Yes. 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 But no, I, for the most part, I mean, the fans are the fans who come up to us are incredibly loyal fans and, and are so educated on the show and all the nuances. And that's the fun thing, especially about being here and meeting you guys and talking about those things that, I mean, we, we get into it because, you know, we love to do sort of nods to the, to the film or, or just, just nuances in our relationship. But it's nice to see that it resonates with you guys. And when we get to talk about it, it's, that's the fun part, you know, that, you know, you catch those little things. But in terms of, you know, I haven't had, quite had that experience, but um, I do, if you haven't watched Psycho, I would recommend you watch it. We all directed this last season, so we had to watch it, uh, we had to, we, we wanted to watch it to pay homage to, pay homage to it. And uh, man, does that film hold up, it's, it's phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, it is fun, it's great. It's just great. <laughs> Up, they wouldn't really have 
you know, wanted to uh, entrust us with the opportunity to do so. And then, yeah, and the, and the actors that you get to work with, both as an actor and then as a director, you you feel so lucky. Like everyone gets the scene so quickly, and you can work on the important stuff in the scene and the nuances of it, as opposed to everyone's just so professional. Um, and I was really lucky with my episode that I got loads of snow in Vancouver, so I had the first snowy episode. And then great scenes with Max and uh, Sheriff Green with Broke Out on the Porch, I love that one. And then of course their big kind of finale, um, Chicks, Chicks Passing, which was, uh, it was just a joy to do it. <laughs> but then what I'm doing is it's the typewriter. So looking over to me and I was like this close to the monitor and breathing really heavily and she's like, what are you doing? I'm, I'm just sort of, just so engrossed by what these two are doing, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, since you brought it up, I'd love to talk about uh, Chick's untimely uh, death. Uh, out of curiosity, who, who cheered for Chick's death? the kind of thing that you don't get to do very often on, 
on a film or a TV show, not to that extent, and, and to that great detail. So it was, I mean, a beautiful ride for, for me, and I, I know for all these guys. Right. And then, what about you, Max? Because you, again, you have to do so much. You have to be the loving husband and father by the end of the show, and then you're kind of in the drug trade kind of early on, <laughs> uh, doing some questionable things. Uh, but again, I think the thing that um, people related to you is that you were kind of the audience's POV. Yeah. Uh, when you would comment on Norman's really weird behavior. <laughs> or like, and I've heard the term. Everybody was thinking it, and I was just saying it, right? Exactly. Yeah. And I've heard the term thrown around that Dylan is my spirit animal. So that was. <laughs> five years because you got, again you guys got to do so much uh, I think you know um, I don't know I, I just I guess like the overall arc of the character was fun to play I mean to be honest like part way through I wasn't really sure where it was where it was going with Dylan I was like all right what's gonna happen with this guy um, and there were times like honestly where there were moments of when I was like a little disappointed because I was like okay I show up like this badass dude on a motorcycle smoking cigarettes, like growing weed, and by the end, like, you know, before the thing's over, I'm leaving with a baby in a minivan. <laughs> you know? And it's like, I was like, huh, All right, let's see where this goes here. Um, but obviously, like, the emotional aspects of the character and the stuff and all the layers that they put in were, were a lot of fun to play and, and kind of really sort of brought it brought it home, so to speak, for me. So it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And what about you, Freddie? Because uh, you got to do so much amazing stuff throughout the whole course of the, sh of the show. I think for me personally, season four is, is like flawless. Your performance from the start of season four on is just like, wow. And it's a shame that he's not been on a at this point. <laughs> Easy to let go now that the show is over. Ooh. I think I think all of us are finding it hard in different ways to let the show go. I mean, there's a there's an odd sense of um, being used to finishing every season and going off to a separate part of the world. But then there's always the promise of being able to return and just do another season at some point. So it'll perhaps sort of hit later on that sense of oh, we're not going back to to our house in Vancouver. That's, completely destroyed. It was 12 hours after we finished the exterior scene, we were back having lunch uh, on stage, and then, you know, bits of the house started to come by. Like, I think that's the window, isn't it? There's like the rose window, and then you'll set this image of the house just completely attacked and destroyed. They seem to have a good time tearing it down. Um, but in terms of this, this season, it was great fun to explore the mother side of Norman more and more and getting to do, um, I mean, particularly with, with Chick, actually, uh, towards the beginning of the season when Norman's in the dress and the wig and kind of full-on switched into that mother persona, uh, that was a really exciting new part to, to explore and kind of work in tandem with Vera. It was a, it, I guess I'd never done it before and neither did she, this idea of creating a character um, that we both had an input into and would both do takes one after the other and kind of watch what the other person did and incorporate some of that and incorporate your own things. So it was a real mix of two of two people. And then you just get a, you know adjusting to I was definitely told to close my legs more time you can dress. It just takes a while to um, to get used to that. And I walk in and he's got the full get up on. And he looks over at me and he's pointing and he's laughing. And he goes, you're going to wear that. It just 
I hopefully, I, it spoke volumes to me and I know to everybody else, but yeah, she's, she's the real deal. She's awesome. <laughs> I mean, really, like, all of us can sit up here and talk about how amazing Dura is all day. Like, as an actress, as a person, um, yeah, I think that, that'll, be, that'll be one of the things that'll be really hard to move on from, I'm sure, for all of us, is, is not to be, like, working with her, because the past five years have been uh, amazing. You can't, you honestly can't hope for, for somebody better to work with and spend, spend a lot of time with, for sure. Yeah, I think Vera is, she, she was wonderful. I think what she brought to the show at the very beginning was perhaps the first to notice and dig out was the humor in, in the show. Um, the dark humor that was always there and always present in everything that Norma did that gave it such life and that balanced it off against the, you know, more horror-like aspects of the, of the show. To such an extent that, I mean, it's funny because you, talk to people who are horror fans, and I've never thought that The Base Motel is, is a horror show at all. I mean, and I think that's testament to what Vera grounded it in emotionally from the very beginning. I mean, it wasn't, it's never been, you know, who's around the corner, who's the, you know, the creepy figure in the darkness, but those horror beams always felt real and, and grounded, as I said, offset by that humor that, you, that, uh, that Vera brought. Um, and it, it became so much more than just than just a horror show, and, and I think large large uh, part of that is down to her. Any more questions? Uh, right away. Yeah, um, this is about Dylan's dunkle. Um, <laughs> dunkle. <laughs> dunkle. <laughs> dunkle. <laughs> Dylan's what? to the role that's so brilliantly written on the page. 
then the character really does come to life. And so I think in those later episodes of the first season, for everyone who is involved, they start writing a, uh, the role with you in mind, as opposed to just a role that they don't, they can't quite picture or imagine in reality yet. Uh, and that's what's been exciting about working on, on you know, this on, on the TV show in general is the opportunity for much greater collaboration in, in that way. That you realise they're starting to write for you once they've seen the, the performance that you're giving. Um, and so that's what's, that's what's been exciting. Are the frame? Norma and Norma have such an inappropriate relationship. Did Network ever like, want to like, pull back on that? And did the writers ever want to push it even further? How inappropriate did it get? That's <laughs> <It's laughs> <really such a, laughs> very inappropriate. I didn't think it was that inappropriate. <laughs> to overt. Uh, I mean, probably the biggest place... <laughs> I'm just spreading selective memory. Um, <laughs> I think it's a scene that they had to reshoot because it was too much. <laughs> Had 
good intentions. Everyone was trying to do the right thing. And that they got waylaid along the way and their own desires would get in the way, but ultimately they were good, they were all good people. Um, even Norman, I think he genuinely tried to do tried to do the right thing. Romero did, Dylan did, and they all had this dream and some and the sort of saddest thing is that it was almost the same dream that they all shared, and yet they still couldn't get it right. You know, Dylan saying, you know, that he wished you know, of course he wished that Norman was still alive and that his daughter would have a grandmother and that they'd all be there as this family, and that's what Norma really wanted and Norman wanted, and they could have worked it out with, with Romero too, and, and Chick, you know, was happy to live in the house. <laughs> and they, but the sad thing is they all ended up, you know, without that, without that very dream that they, that they all started with. Oh, we have time for two more questions. Uh, that's um, anybody comment about Oh yeah, gotta give it up for Emma, it'll be a good one. The old wifey. <laughs> uh, Olivia is, she's amazing, she's so talented, and you know, when, when the first season she showed up, but I think she was like 18, and she really, she had like never done anything acting wise. Uh, she came over from England, had a really hard time breaking her accent. I think in the, in the first season, um, so much to where they, they wrote her a British dad. <laughs> uh, but she, like, to watch her sort of like blossom as an actress over five years was honestly like, it was amazing, it was remarkable to watch just sort of her, her transformation um, as an actress and as, as a woman uh, was, was kind of just, I don't know. It was really cool to see, and uh, obviously she's really, really sweet and kind, and we all have lots of nice things to say about her. So. I think we have time for one more. So yeah, we'll back right there. Jim, send it up. If you could be a different character on the show, yeah. yeah. Would you, if you could pick a different <laughs> character to play, who would it be on the show? Well, I think in the last scene, uh, Nestor would have chose to have been <laughs> Dylan. <laughs> Maybe Norman? No, I don't, I don't think I would have would, 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 For me, Romero was, was, was the role, for sure. I couldn't have like, asked for anything more. I would play Norman. <laughs> Freddie, is there anyone else you would have played on this show if you weren't Norman? You'd be Jow? <laughs> Jow is the, um, the boring, yeah. <laughs> the sex slave in season one who was caught up in the whole thing. I didn't, I wouldn't really have wanted to play Jow. I was more just thinking of someone. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't well thought through. But if you missed it, the sex slave from season one that escapes is the realtor selling the house at the end of the final episode. Yeah. Then we watched that. They brought her back for that, which is really cool. So that was what happened to Jow. She kind of 